Good morning, Pastor Gene Oller here, Word of Hope Church in Cadiz, Kentucky, and we're glad you joined us today, and uh, we just rejoice in this day that God has given us. It's raining here, it may not be where you are, but I tell you, even though it rains here, the Son of God always shines through the darkest storm clouds of life. We can depend upon God, He's faithful. We can stand fast on His promises and know that God is with us. In difficult and troubled times, God is there to help his people, and we're just fortunate to know the Lord. I'm so glad that I heard the gospel and got born again 46 years ago. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then Tina's going to sing a song for us. So, so let's just pray together. Father, today we just come to you in that glorious and mighty name of Jesus, that name above every name, the one who has all authority and all power. Lord Matthew 28 tells us, and Lord Jesus, today we honor you and bless you. We invite the Holy Spirit to come and flow in this place and into the homes and cars and devices, wherever people are watching the gospel, here in America and overseas and, and even in Canada, Lord. We just thank you, God, for an opportunity, and we want to bless you today. Father, we love you, and we thank you for hearing our prayers and meeting our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Gotcha. Jesus. Lord, we just praise you and bless you and honor you today, Lord, because we're never alone, Lord. Oh, Lord, once we got into this wonderful family of God, once you became, Lord, our Savior, Lord, and Master, we've never been alone. You said that you were going to go so the Holy Spirit would come in the, in the book of John, and we're so grateful for the Comforter who has come. We're not our orphans anymore. We're not alone anymore. You're with us always, even to the ends of the earth as we follow you. We thank you. We praise you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Appreciate that song so much, Tina. God bless you. And, and uh, you know, you may be there today and you may feel alone. You may be discouraged or, or have anxieties and fears about the uncertainty of what's going to happen tomorrow. But right now, in this moment, you can embrace Christ, and he can fill your heart and mind with his word and his promises. These are choices that we make, but when we begin to look at his promises, we begin to look at his love for us and what he's done for us, then we don't have to be afraid of tomorrow. We just live for him in this moment today, and day by day, God takes care of us. We talked about the other day in Matthew, the sixth chapter, how that God has been revealed uh, as a heavenly father who takes good care of his children. And our part, our response to that, Jesus said, is not to worry about things, to simply cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us and to trust God and seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's our part, to run hard after God, not trying to earn, but just trying to know and get closer and dwell in his presence, letting God be Lord over everything in our lives. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I've got an announcement to make. Uh, next Sunday, May the 24th, we'll be having our first uh, in-house service in a long time. I think it was around the 15th of March, the last time we met in-house. And, uh, you know, there are guidelines that we have to follow, and we've sent out information to all of our uh, members and people that uh, attend this church and are friends of the church to let them know. And I encourage people that as we start going back to church, to do so safely, uh, to respect other people. Uh, you know, you might be totally comfortable next Sunday wherever you go to church at, and, and, and you might want to run up and give people hugs, but they may not be okay with that, and they may not actually tell you that. And so I think you need to give people distance. We need to uh, practice some of the rules that have been laid down, social distancing and, and other things, so that... Um, you know, we remain safe and people are comfortable in the house of God. In our church, we're spreading all of our seating out to six to eight foot. I think eight foot is what it's going to work out being so that we have room to accommodate uh, the 33% capacity that's allowed right now. And uh, I just want to encourage you to be safe because things are opening up doesn't mean we just need to go back to the same old way. I heard somebody talking about a church somewhere in this area. 
who last week opened, their parking lot was totally filled. Cars were parked on their grass throughout the area. And I guess the building was packed. And I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Uh, so that's just something to think about. God bless you. Well, we want to read scripture to you this morning. The title of our message is Scatter and Gather. And uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, uh, hopefully. And this is probably part one in a series. And uh, uh, we want to make you aware of that. We're going to look in Matthew 28. Oh, yeah. And uh, when we start next week, we're going to continue doing live services. So we'll still be here on Sunday morning. Uh, the live part may not start till a little closer to 11. Uh, but we will be here live in, our, in all of our services just like we have been. And so we'll just have to figure that out as we go. So thank you for joining us. Matthew 28 beginning at verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And, and we've already prayed. And, and this is Jesus' message uh, to the disciples as he's preparing to descend into heaven. And you might remember in an earlier message, we talked about Acts in uh, the first chapter, verse 8. And there Jesus defined the church in Acts 1.8. And what he defined them as is a spirit-empowered people that are a witness for Christ and who are on a mission. And that's exactly what he's talking about here when he, when he sent the church out into the world. He said, I've been given all power and authority, and I want you to go, therefore. And so when we talk about scattering and gathering, when we talk about church, a lot of times when we think of church, we're trying to get people to come to us. We want people to come to our church. We want people to come to our building. But we want to see church in the way that Jesus saw church. And quite frankly, he didn't see it as a building. He saw it as a people. People that were spirit-empowered, witnessing for him, going on a mission to share the gospel. And so uh, the church meets in a building. But the church is not a building, really. And so we try to get people to come to us. But you notice when Jesus great, gave the Great Commission, he didn't say to the 11 when they met him on the mountain, I'm going to be going into heaven in a few minutes. I've got all power and all authority. And right here where I'm at today would be a great spot on top of this mountain for you all to build the new church. And you could build a huge building right up here. And everybody would see it. And you could tell people around about because this was a tall mountain. You could point and say, uh, that's where Jesus ascended. And our church is going to be called the Church of the Ascension. And we're right up there on the mountain. And anywhere around that area, you'd be able to tell somebody and invite them to church and point up there. And they would know where the church is. And, and while that would be great uh, marketing strategies... While that would be a great way to start a club or some organization, that's not the way Jesus said to do it. He said, I'm, I have all authority. I'm giving you power to go. Power to go. Not power to stay, but power to go. Go implies doing something. Uh, going implies a, a message, a mission, a job, a responsibility. And some translations and commentators say that, that, that going there means as you go. And I like to think of sharing our faith is as we go through our life, the Lord's leading us to various jobs or occupations or, or, or places in this world. Most of us work jobs and we're involved in, in the commerce and taking care of our families. God leads us in many different directions with our lives. But wherever we're going, he wants us to share this glorious good news of Jesus. And there is a time for the church to scatter and a time for the church to gather. So it's not so much about coming to us, although there is a time when the church meets together. Uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, talks about having apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. And so it would be obvious that we would join together. But in reality, and I know it's a little bit of a play on words, 
uh, we don't go to church. Uh, we, we are the church, and we meet in a building. We, we are the church uh, in the office. We are the church. If you're a born-again believer, if you fit the definition of spirit and power and witness on a mission for God, that's what Acts 1-8 is talking about. And then we see that beginning in Acts, the second chapter. Then that's what you do. You, you just share Jesus everywhere you go. You are the church. And wherever two or three of us gather together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. So does that mean, Pastor, that uh, we shouldn't have buildings and we shouldn't meet like we do? No, it doesn't mean that. But we need to understand that this is a church, that we are the church, and we need to learn something here, get encouragement, strength, teaching, and understanding, develop our gifts, maybe find our calling. And then when we go out of here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, or when you go out of small groups, Realize that you're going out the door to the mission field that Jesus has sent us to. It's not all about the building. It's all about us being spirit empowered, a spirit-empowered witness of Jesus going somewhere to share him in our community or around the world. And so this scattering is what Jesus did. He had resurrected from the dead. He had met, met with the 11 apostles and other people. Uh, the scripture says that 500 actually saw him when he ascended. So there were women, there were people from the community, there were rich people and poor people. There were the 11 uh, disciples or apostles, we call them, that were with him. And he met with them possibly on eight different occasions from the time of his resurrection till the time 10 days prior to Pentecost where he told them that they needed to go wait in an upper room in Jerusalem until they'd be endued with power for service. They'd be endued with power to be that witness. And uh, during that 40-day period, he taught them many things. He demonstrated things to them. He showed them and taught them other things that they had not learned while being ministering with him for three years of ministry. And so they were gathering together during that time. But it's going to come to a place to where they're going to begin to scatter again. They're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we'll get to that in just a minute. How that in the book of Acts, uh, when the church began to grow, they preach the gospel. Uh, and they begin to go out and share this good news. And so God is wanting us to go to people. He's wanting the gospel to go where people are. You know, the indigenous tribes of some island somewhere can't get in a boat and come to America. We need to go to them. Maybe your neighbor is never going to come to a church because of some bad experience or something that went on in their life, and yet you could still go to them. Maybe your co-worker is an individual who's not interested in coming to a building full of people that he doesn't know. Maybe during this time of a virus uh, where people are really leery about gatherings, uh, you know, you could share the good news at a safe distance with them. We can go to people in whatever context is possible. As we go to the bank, as we go uh, to the grocery store, as we go get our car worked on, as we go to a job, as we go to school, as we go to the grocery, whatever, we can share the good news of Jesus. And over in Acts 2, uh, Peter has preached, and, and we talked about it in another message. In verse 38, he said, uh, this, is what, this is how the gospel begins in a person's life. Uh, then Peter preached or said, repent. And this was after they had asked what they needed to do. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is on you and your children and all to it that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted or taught them, saying, save yourself from this on toward generation, this ungodly generation. And that was the message that ultimately led 3,000 people, 3,000 people um, uh, to Christ uh, so that they would uh, uh, begin what would have been the church. And uh, it's so important to realize that there's something that has to take place. And when he preached to these people, they didn't have a building, but yet they became a part of the body of Christ. And so there were some things that took place. There was preaching. There was a call to turn from your sin, to have deep sorrow, uh, uh, you know, for sinning against a loving God who wants to be our father, father and who wants us to follow them. They were baptized in water, and the scripture teaches about that. 
and they were baptized and they went in the name of the authority of Jesus' name. And Jesus told them to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we believe that that's how they did that. And Matthew, we read a while ago, talked about that. And this was the beginning of people who would be, um, uh, they would be a spirit-empowered individuals who would be a witness for Jesus, and they would go on a mission for the Lord. In verse 41 talks again about characteristics. Now, I know I shared this in another message, but I, I think we need to hear this over and over until we begin to realize that the church is the church, and it has nothing to do with our, our buildings. Let me share a story with you. And this came from the Voice of the Martyrs, an organization that uh, shares the gospel in countries primarily uh, where the church can't really be, where people are suffering and, and being uh, persecuted and losing their lives. And, and so uh, the Voice of the Martyrs, Ma Martyrs uh, shares the gospel in the country of Iran. And uh, the way they do that is through satellite TV. And one of the leaders of the Voice of the Martyrs says, that we go over the head of Isfalan and all the terrorist groups because the satellite can't be stopped if people have receivers. And so in that country currently, uh, there's around 400 Christians that we know of that are in prison, or 400 uh, Christians in prison today, and there's about 2 million Christians in that nation. And persecution is heavy. Sometimes people lose their lives or are put in prison. And the satellite signal goes into that country it not only tells them uh teaches them how to know christ but it teaches them uh, how to share their faith with their family they see and hear how to share their faith it teaches them how to start groups or meet with people in their homes and we would call those home churches or house churches or house gatherings and uh and so this young man was 19 years old and he heard the gospel uh, living in a place where the gospel is illegal. He heard the gospel being preached, the voice of the martyr on satellite, and he heard, learned about Jesus and how to accept Christ, and he accepted the Lord into his life. Then he kept watching programs, and uh, he learned how to share the gospel with his family. So he began to share the gospel with his family and friends, and some of them came to Christ. Then he learned how to start house gatherings or house churches was the term they use. And uh, he began to, to start meeting and having Bible studies and sharing everything that he had learned. He, he began to share with other people. And by the time he was 22 years old, he had started five house gatherings or churches. And he won many, many people to Christ. And it was then that he got arrested. And so when they arrested him, he got a five-year sentence in prison. And uh, there in prison, he was uh, with other people, not Christians, but he was there with other people of a different faith, and he was persecuted. Uh, the prison did not treat him well. He suffered for the cause of Christ, sometimes being mistreated and beaten while he was there. And uh, he got real sick at one point, and I think the, the government did an unusual thing. They took him out, and they let him have treatment in a hospital for the illness. And they said, you have to go back and serve your five months. But he was taken to a hospital. And while he was at the hospital, he got access to a telephone. And he called the voice of the martyrs. He called them, I believe, here in America. I'm not sure what office it was. And uh, so one of the operators, they get the call there. And, and uh, he says, he gives them his name. I'm not going to say his name for two reasons. One, I wouldn't want to endanger him further. And secondly, I can't pronounce it anyway. And so, so they said, this guy said, I, I'm a believer in prison in Iran, and, and I want to talk to uh, Pastor so-and-so. This was the man that was producing the teachings that he was watching through satellite. And so they, they let him know this young man wants to talk with him. And he begins to wonder. Uh, they tell him he's a young man in prison. And he actually had to get off the phone and was going to call back. And so this, this leader in the movement, the pastor there that was working on this particular project through satellite TV, he's thinking about this young man that's been in prison for his faith because, you know, they told him to accept Christ. They taught him how to share his faith. They taught him how to start home groups. And now this young man is 22 years old and in prison in a bad way 
in Iran, and he's thinking, I wonder if this young man is going to want to ask me, where is this God that you talked about? Where's this good God? Because now I'm in prison and I'm suffering. Or, or maybe, maybe he would say, where are you at? You, you taught us on satellite to do this, and you're in America, and you're safe, and I've done this, and now look at me. Look at me. I'm in poor health, and I'm beaten, and I'm injured, and I'm in the hospital, and I've got to go back to jail for five more months. Now, this young man had already been in prison for four years and seven months when he had this unusual opportunity to make a phone call. So when he called back, the operator uh, passed that on to the pastor, and he answered the phone, and he said he heard the most pleasant voice of a young man. And this man began to talk with him and began to tell his story. And he said, you know, I saw the gospel. And when I saw the gospel on, uh, on the satellite, I received Christ. And then I got your teachings on how to witness and share Jesus with my family, and I did that. And some of them got saved. And then I began to start house churches. And uh, by the time I was 22, I had five house churches, and then they arrested me. And, and this, this pastor is wondering, what's he going to say next to me? But that young man said, I called to encourage you. I called to thank you for sharing through satellite TV so that me and hundreds and thousands of others could know the Lord. You see, he didn't mind that he was suffering for Jesus. He didn't mind that he'd lost freedom and that he was ill-treated in prison. Certainly, he didn't enjoy that and didn't want that, but he was so grateful to know Jesus. I wonder what a price tag I put on knowing Jesus. I wonder what the value of me knowing Christ is. I wonder if in our American culture, if something really strange happened and the government said you could never reopen your churches. You can never meet together in a crowd like this anymore. You can't do that anymore. You can't preach the gospel. You can't share the good news. Somebody said, well, that's crazy. It never happened in America. Well, I never thought we would come to a day to where we would shut our churches down for eight or nine or more weeks and live under some of the restrictions that we're living under now. I don't truly call that persecution because of the health risk, but still I do see that as a possibility of open doors for more difficulties in the future. How are we going to respond? If my attitude about the church is I go to church and, and that's what church is to me, it's a place I go, then we're going to really be lost and undone. But if we right now, beginning and going forward, begin to realize that I am the church, that I am the body of Christ, that I have something that dwells in me. You see, if you're truly born again, and I know there are many that go to church that have no idea of what it is to know Christ. They're religious. But if you're truly born again, Christ dwelling in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can be a witness. Boldness comes with that experience. And so we are the church, and we've got to be willing to carry the message. This young man listened, found Christ, shared Christ, started building what we would call churches, home meetings. And then he went to jail. And he was grateful. He told the man at the voice of the martyrs, he said, have you not read in the 23rd Psalm where the Lord has prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies? He said, had I never been put in prison, I would never have this wonderful opportunity and be so honored to be sitting among my enemies and share the gospel. Because you see, in those jail cells, they're not private cells. There are large cells. There are people in there of another faith. So he's sharing Christ to a hostile crowd of people who consider themselves his enemies. But he is loving them and sharing Jesus. And he said, it's an opportunity. It's an honor. If I had never been in this prison, I would never be able to share Jesus with these folks. You see, where God told David in Psalms 23, I've prepared a table before you. Or David said God had prepared a table before him in the presence of his enemies. We don't think of that. We live in a world where there are people that are not friends of the gospel. We need to love them and bless them. We live in a world where the church has made big mistakes and problems and difficulties. And so sometimes the world looks at the church very negatively. But we're also in a world where God's people thrive and share the good news. Where the greatest acts of love and kindness 
and uh, reaching out and making a difference has been done by the body of Christ, by born-again believers. And yes, they attend a building, and we call the building the church, but if the building is gone, we would still exist. I don't have the list in front of me, but during this shutdown, I know that we've helped seven homeless individuals. I know we delivered food boxes now at least to seven different uh, families outside of our church, not people that go to church here. And we've also been able to help one another and deliver food and, and goods to people that are a part of this local assembly or group of people. And many of you have done things that I don't know anything about. Some of you have taken food. You've visited the sick. Maybe you've cut grass for people who could not cut their grass. You have reached out during this time of this pandemic as a believer and made a difference. And we need to continue doing that. We need to see uh, what Christianity is about is not coming to church, but it's about going and sharing. We come to church for fellowship. We come together in a group to learn and to be taught and to share and, and for God to develop our gifts and talents for his kingdom. But we're way more than a club or an organization. We're called to be the body of Christ. And you know one thing about the body of Christ that we don't think about in context of church usually is that the body of Christ, he suffered in his body for us. We think about that in context of salvation. But sometimes as a believer, there is persecution and suffering. We see that in the story of the young man that I just shared and and there are tens of thousands of other stories like that to be shared where people are suffering as a part of the body of Christ. I wonder today, as you think about your life, if you're a believer, if you consider yourself born-again believer, do you see yourself as a church? Do you see yourself as a person that's been empowered by the Spirit of God to be a witness for Jesus on a mission in this world, no matter what your occupation or vocation is. Is that how you see yourself? Because that was the requirement, it seems, that Jesus put upon the early church. So when they begin to preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, people begin to join in with that group. And uh, uh, we'll just hit the highlights as we prepare to close. It says they continued constantly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They were people that were bound together. I heard somebody share a story about an elder in his church. It's Francis Chan that shared the story. And one of the elders in his church has obscenities tattooed on his uh, eyelids because before he got born again, he was a member of a notorious gang. And he thought, when I die, I want to leave a message. And the message that he wanted to leave was an ungodly message that I would not repeat. And Mr. Chan did not say in entirety when he shared the message. But this man got born again after he got out of prison. He was in prison for years for a crime he did not commit. And now he's the elder in a church in California and loves Jesus and shares his faith. And so one day, Brother Chan asked him, he said, what's it like being in a gang? What's that all about? And he said, well, he said, it's all about uh, camaraderie, fellowship, hanging out together. It's about looking out for each other. It's about being a member of something that is bigger than you are and collectively much stronger and more powerful. And he shared a lot of things about what it's like to be in a gang. Well, you know, that is a description of the church. We're meant to be a group of people that continue in those teachings that we find in the Word of God having fellowship and sharing communion and praying together. But then we go out in the world and we represent that. And so gang members and, and members of uh, biker organizations, notorious biker organizations, they wear their colors. They wear their patches. You'll see them. And when they're riding down the road on motorcycles, uh, you know, they always have a signal or a sign that they give to each other, depending on who the other group is or if it's one of their groups. You see, they're a tight-knit group of people, but they don't have Christ necessarily. And the church is meant to be a tight-knit group of people, not that isolates, but rather invites people to know this Jesus. It's more than getting people to come to church. It's more than coming to church. It's about how we live our lives every day. And it says that they had fellowship, communion. They, they broke the bread and the body of Christ and the and the the juice that represents his blood. They partook of that together. They prayed. Fear came upon people. There was an incredible fear and reverence for God 
for his holiness and majesty that was evident in the lives of the believers. They respected and honored God so highly and loved one another so much that people wanted to be a part of that kind of a family, that type of a fellowship. Signs and wonders were done by the apostles, later the deacons in the church, and later the followers of Christ. Signs and wonders became a pattern in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the church age. Still today, there are miracles that take place when people pray and believe God. It says that they had all things common together, that the believers uh, sold their possessions when necessary to help and meet the needs of other people. You see, they were a family. I have two daughters, and if my daughters need something, I do what it takes to meet that need. That's the way the body of Christ is called to be. If we're just a church and a club, then we have meetings and we decide about helping and we do things. But God is calling us to make an investment in people, in one another. This church that Christ is talking about is living and breathing. It goes everywhere we go. And if the government shut the buildings down, if the government took away the buildings, the church could still live and thrive. In the nation uh, of Iran, uh, there are all these believers, uh, two million believers who are meeting together, sharing the gospel, loving each other in a nation where it's illegal uh, to have true believing churches. But it didn't stop them. It's not about buildings. It's about coming together and loving and taking care of each other and inviting other people to join into that fellowship, that community. It involves a building. But if we didn't have buildings, we would still be the church. This group of people that I'm a part of, I'm privileged to be called the pastor of, well, we've been able to do more than we typically do. Not near enough, not all that we want to do. But we've helped more people, seven homeless people during this time. That's a higher than average number. We delivered uh, five, uh, actually six food boxes. Some of them had more stuff. Somebody else delivered one. So maybe six or seven families received food. That's more than normal. And we've been able to help other people. You see, the church is still alive and functioning because it's not dependent upon us coming together in a large number. It is dependent upon us being a tight net group, family members loving and taking care of each other, even if we have to do it in smaller groups. There was incredible generosity among the believers. And they continued daily and one accord in the temple, the breaking of bread from house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They continued daily in incredible unity. I tell you, the body of Christ needs to be unified. And I'm guilty and need help in that area, but we need to be unified with believers. Believers ought to be a common, uh, believing in Christ ought to be a common connection where we can work together, where we can uh, love one another and demonstrate such a love that people would want to be a part of people like that. It's not something we join, it's something we become. You can join a church. But that's not the same as becoming a believer and follower in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to point out here, uh, they did meet in the temple. The church met together there. But then that was the gathering. They came together in that temple. But then there was the scattering because it says they went out and went house to house. <clears throat> and there they ate meals together. They, they talked about the apostles' teachings. They, they didn't have CD and all the things that we have. They didn't have a Bible. Individuals did not. So the, the apostles, they were the first ministers. Uh, they preached and taught the gospel. And then people went out and went to people's homes, went to visit neighbors and friends, and shared the glorious good news of Jesus with other people. And they ate together, and they fellowshiped, and they loved one another. And it says uh, that they went praising God, and they had favor with God and people. And the Lord added to the church those that should be saved. You see, they didn't have a church building. So where did he add them? Did he add them to the Jewish temple? Well, probably not because the very temple they preached in was ran by the Sanhedrin that it had Christ crucified. So, so that isn't what they were doing, but they were meeting together. The church was meeting together. They met in houses. Did the houses then all of a sudden have a steeple on top and have service times? Oh, no. No, they just got together when they had opportunities and they shared their faith one with another. You see, there's times to gather and there's times to scatter. We've been in a season that involved being scattered. 
not by choice, but scattered nonetheless. And that's still going to continue. Some things will not return to normal anytime soon. And in many ways, I hope that the body of Christ does not turn, return to normal. I hope that we begin to live our lives on a mission, uh, spirit-empowered witnesses for Christ on a mission wherever we go in this world. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your glorious faithfulness and goodness. We thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins. And Lord, I pray right now for anybody that's listening that needs to know you, that they will, Lord, ask you in their heart, confess in their sins, and asking you to be Lord and Master and Savior of, your life, of their lives, Lord. God, I pray you bless the body of Christ, not just people that go to this facility, but all the groups of believers all over that are serving the Lord, that you would help us all to realize we are the church. Even when we can't meet together in the building, we could still meet with one another and according to the guidelines at this time and, and we could still minister to the lost and help the needy and feed the neck uh, feed the uh, the hungry and clothe the naked god we can still visit by way of technology and share the good news lord we can use this as a time uh lord to get closer to you lord i thank you for this opportunity today bless the people in jesus name amen amen now if you receive the lord or if you're needing encouragement uh, send me a message in the comments or or in Facebook Messenger to Gene Oller, and I'll be glad to get you some um, resources that will really help you. And some people requested them, and I've talked with them, and yep, it's helping them, they said. And so discouragement or fear or what to do, uh, we've got some resources that will help you. So please get in touch with me so we can do that. And let me encourage you tonight at 6 o'clock, uh, Jack Rutland's going to be speaking and uh, that'll be 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time this evening. God bless you. Uh, you have a good day.